Bless them. Okay. Adults, you are now here. Youth, we're getting ready to continue our study a little bit more on the tabernacle. Let's get some visual help today, and then I'll come back and talk to you a little longer. Just beyond the altar of incense was the Holy of Holies. This dwelling place of God was so solemn and set apart that the veil would only be opened once a year. It was then that the high priest would meet with God. Pushing back the veil reveals the article above which this most holy meeting would occur, the Ark of the Covenant. Have them make a chest of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it, and fasten them to its four feet, with two rings on one side, and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the chest to carry it. Make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. And make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark and put in the ark the testimony, which I will give you. There, above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. Lord, thank you for, for um, these illustrations that you gave your people so long ago that help us to understand your life in us. <laughs> Open our eyes to see you in us today. In your name we pray, amen. This is the fifth time. I've told, they're just going to leave that up there for a minute. This is the fifth time I've talked to you or I'm going to talk to you about the tabernacle and how we are the tabernacle of God. And so I found this illustration, this uh, DVD that's helpful because at least you get some visual, you get an idea. And uh, so we talked, I'll do a little review in a little, uh, a little bit. But basically this all started because I was talking to you all about how we study the Old Testament as New Testament Christians. Now my wording on that series title is very exact. How do we study the Old Testament as New Testament Christians? And you say, oh pastor, no, all Christians are New Testament. No, they don't always act like it. I believe there, there are people who have accepted Christ, but they insist on living in the Old Testament. Everything is old, and, but yet they've accepted Christ. They're going to heaven, but the reality of life in Christ hasn't been realized. And this is what the Apostle Paul had to deal with a lot when he would try to, I know he was pulling his hair out, you know, when he was talking to his brothers and, and his sisters, when they would try to make people do things like get circumcised again or make sacrifices after they accepted Christ. Paul would say, no, no, no. In Christ, we're new creations. The old stuff is gone. And so this is how this kind of evolved. So I started on this series so how do we study the Old Testament as New Testament Christians? We study it, giving you the bottom line, I'm jumping ahead here. We study it understanding that everything, every type, every shadow, every allegory, every illustration, every personality of significance, every event, all points to the, to the greatest act of all history. And that is the saving, uh, the saving example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything, 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 everything. We talk about him. We sing about him. I love that song that we sing. Well, it's in his name. Who wrote that song? Cindy wrote it. Yeah. See, that's characteristic. I wish y'all would put your names on these songs. Humility is an interesting thing. Let me tell you what they do. I'm going to pick on them. 
They have everyone else's name up when there's a song that has been written, you know, the, the regular songs. You'll see Jack Hayford, whoever wrote the song, Hill Song. And then you can always know when one of them has written a song because it has no name. <laughs> Trying to, don't be, put your name on the songs. And then we'll sing louder because we know it's right along with our theology. So praise the Lord. So, so um, this idea of Jesus being the wrapping, the enveloping, the everything was seen throughout the entire Old Testament, if you know how to read it, and also through the New Testament, it becomes a little bit easier. So these are the kind of things we talked about. Before I go on today, let me try to give you a little synopsis of some of the things we talked about. And you can purchase, of course, the CDs in the last five weeks uh, if you want to know more. We talked about in the Old Testament after the fall, we understand why things are like they are in earth. We understand the effect of sin on the earth when you see that. We understand when you study the New Testament, these are things you learn in the Old Testament, I'm sorry. The profile of people when they know God but lack the example and, and influence of the Lord Jesus in their life. Now listen to me today. Some of you young people don't zone out on me or some of you adults who are, you think, oh, she's theological. No, no, hear me. I am talking today about the reality of why we can know that Christ is in us and we are his tabernacle. We're the place where he lives. We can be excited about that. You know, we went, uh, some of our, the women here were with us. We went to England one time for a win class. That's the Women's International Network. And while we were there, there was the Queen's birthday. Was it her birthday? Is that what it was? Okay, Queen's birthday. The Queen's birthday. And so people camp out to be a part of her birthday parade, to observe it for like a day before. We show up some hours before and we're packed in line. You gotta get this. I mean, the, the parade goes for miles and miles. That whole route is packed with people. We might be five or six back, remember? We had Hosanna with us. I think Paul, we put Hosanna on our shoulders. Okay. Now listen, this is all to get a glimpse of the queen. Okay. I have the pictures. And people have flowers, they want to they wanna put at her feet, you know. And then the cavalcade starts, and Bishop, who says she's taller than me, Bishop LaDonna, she says, Shy, I know that, that's one of those hats, that might be her. And we all scream, there's the queen! Get, we, okay, listen, to get a glimpse, hear me, of the queen. We stand for hours. I'm going to say we glimpsed her, I mean, we saw her, 20 seconds, what would y'all say? About that big in 20 seconds. And, do you still have pictures? Yes. You have pictures? We have pictures. We saw the queen. Listen to me. <laughs> Why is that? It's because there's something in the human nature that ascribes to something greater than. And really, you know, we saw, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the monarchy and all that, but forget all of that. My point is, if people would be excited about seeing a human monarch, a human ruler. People come to see Dr. Tia and they're so excited they would wait in line. They're so thrilled that he's sitting just among the people. How much more when someone stands here and says, no, listen, you are the tabernacle of God. I'm not even talking about seeing God. I'm talking about God living on the inside of you through Jesus Christ. This is why I have pictures and videos and I decided next week, Hope you'll come because it's a holiday weekend, though I know, I don't know if that has anything to do with it. But anyhow, and the kids are in service. I decided, oh, I have a model kit. I'll, I'll just erect the tabernacle here. The kids will like that, and you can see it, and it won't have to be as heavy, and you can get a picture of it. And so we've been looking at this idea of the tabernacle. So when you study the Old Testament, you learn about uh, what happens when people have these types and shadows and these things they do, these rituals, these formulas, but they don't connect it with Jesus Christ. We're connecting it with Jesus Christ. We're understanding that every example, every ritual, everything they did wasn't meant to last forever. It was meant to help us recognize Messiah when he comes. And his name is? Jesus. All right. So anyhow, I got like 12 pages here, so I'm going to get past that. That's great. That's page one. We talked about uh, when we look at the, the tabernacle, we see the character of God because that's the scripture that's right there, and that's in Exodus chapter 25. We understand that God wants to live inside of his people, and he never gave up on that, even though we had decided we didn't want to live with him. The first place we see that is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. 
The Bible says God created people in his image, and he didn't just create them like the animals. So all of you animal lovers, don't be angry at me. But, you know, you didn't just create them like the animals and say, that's good. He didn't just handle them like the plants and say, good. He created us and said, very good. And what he did is the Bible says he breathed his breath into us. Yes. His human creation had his breath. And so I said, when you look at the tabernacle, you see the character of God. And the reason I say that, because what you're realizing is that even after we rejected the life of God, the, the breath of God, he still figured out a way to come and live among his people. That's the God of character. That's the God you can trust. That's the kind of God that when he tells you, listen, I'm your healer. Don't worry about a thing. Your body is my temple. I'm there for you. There's no sickness or disease that's going to, that's a God that you can trust and say, okay, I'm taking it. That's the kind of God you can trust when you're struggling financially and it doesn't look like ends are going to meet. Well, he's a God of character. If he did not give up on his people when they didn't want to be with him, but he said, I want to live among them. I don't care. I still want to be part of them then he's the kind of God who doesn't just leave you. You're here today, and you come to church, and you feel and you think you may be guilty, for example. I haven't been in church in so long. Or, boy, I know what happened last night. I know what happened last week. Does God really love me? Well, when you look at the Old Testament, you have, a, even before you get to Jesus, you have an unfolding drama of the faithfulness of God to never give up on his creation. And he's not giving up on you. He's not giving up on me. He doesn't have give up in his vocabulary. He's the God of second, third, fourth, 80,000 chances. Amen. And he's never given up on you. So all of that, when I read the Old Testament, I see all of that. I see the tenacity of God. That's what I'm saying. That I'm not going to give up on you, part of God. I see the love of God. And here's why. God wasn't happy just to be living in a tabernacle or a temple or just a place. He did not give up until he himself, the scripture said, by his own arm, put on flesh, came in the person of Jesus Christ, walked among us, lived among us, gave his life for us. Not just that, my goodness, it wasn't just enough that he sacrificed. That was vile. But then he hung around for a while, made sure we understood he was alive, and then he gave us his spirit. Now, I'm trying to stick with my notes so I'm not jumping all over the place and yelling, but this is so major to be the house, the dwelling place, the tabernacle of, of a living God. Because, if you've been here on Wednesdays, you've learned this, from the time of Adam, male and female, when God breathed his breath into his creation, until Jesus, Dr. T.L. taught us on Wednesdays, no one else had the spirit of God on the inside of them. That's right. All of that time. No, you had the spirit of God hovering around people, inspiring people, anointing people for certain things on the outside. That's why we tell you, don't talk about, oh, that's anointed or that. We want to pray for anointing. No, 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 no. That's an old covenant concept. When you have Christ, you have the anointed one on the inside of you. Yes. But people didn't realize that for hundreds, thousands of years, from the time of Adam until Jesus came, no one else had the breath of God on the inside of them. So then we casually say, would you like to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Or we casually say, yes, I'm the tabernacle of God. And to me, that is just, well, the way I grew up, we would say those are shouting words. Those are shouting words. To realize that this God of the universe uh, lives in, on the inside of us. So, so I said, the next thing in this progression over five weeks, I'm reviewing for you. After we saw God's desire to never give up on his people, and then Jesus comes on the scene. You can actually follow the gospel icon, and you understand, you get it. As a Christian, you begin to realize what Paul said in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. The fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Jesus bodily. And you go, wow, that's awesome. God came in flesh. We like that story, right? We get that. He came in flesh. He loved us. He walked among us. And we get all excited, and we should about that. But then, what, I'm, what we're doing is we're going one step further and realizing God didn't stop living in flesh when Jesus left this earth. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus accomplished or did something so that we could be cleaned up, fixed up, made up, whatever you want to say, so that now God can live back on the inside of us, his creation, which was his original idea. So that's why I said, not only do we understand the character of God, we understand the tenacity of God, but we understand the, the love of God. Peter himself, the same one who caught it at Pentecost and said, oh my God, 
look what's going on. I'm telling you how Peter said it. It was, it was in Aramaic, but this is how he said it. He said, oh my God, look what's going on. This is what our prophet Joel said would happen, that one day it would be possible for the Spirit of God to be poured out on everybody. That's what he said at the day of Pentecost, Peter. But then he got a little more knowledge about 10 years later or so. He wrote, he wrote some epistles, some letters. And in those, let me give you the reference, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Then he even got even bolder. He says, don't you know what Jesus did? Made us partakers of the divine nature. Partaker, these are, again, these are all big concepts. Partakers of the divine nature through what Jesus did. Through what Jesus did. So we talked about that a little bit. Again, I'm just reviewing. Oh boy, we talked about what it means I mean, the tabernacle of God. We talked about what it means to have Christ in us. We talked about that in light of our Wednesday night teaching that Dr. T.L. has given us. And that's just not to be, to just be in relationship with Jesus, me and you, baby, that's it. No, no, no. We start there, but then it goes to other people. It goes to other people. And that's what he calls the worship rut. We get out of the worship rut. We love to worship. We love to, to praise God. But we have wasted our time today. If our worship and excitement today, and we leave this door, and we don't tell anybody anything good, and we're not a light, or we don't touch anyone, see? So we, so we moved, we progressed, if you will, from understanding God in the first person, that was Adam. He breathed his breath. To number two, God showing up and to the person uh, of Jesus Christ, and then understanding how it touches us. Well, now, all of that is illustrated in the tabernacle. That's where I'm going. It's all illustrated in the tabernacle. And so Exodus chapter 25, write this down. Verse 8, that's what I had, that's what I had them put up on the screen today. God said to Moses, make them or have them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Have them make me a house where I can be among them. And so this is the place we are in Exodus chapter 25 after five different times me trying to work us to this understanding that if we can get a glimpse of this tabernacle, we have another illustration to help us understand what it means to be the carrier of the life of God. It means more than just talking in tongues. Though I love to talk in tongues. I'm a good Pentecostal. I'm a tongue yeller, screamer. I love, it's wonderful. The wonderful heavenly language. I'll never forget when I felt like when I received the Holy Ghost and began to speak another language. But that's just the beginning. The Spirit of God comes to live on the inside of us. We're the tabernacle of God. And we're talking about what that means. So last week I talked to you about the outer courts of the tabernacle and the things that some of y'all were shouting on. I'm not going to go over it again, but how that every day in that tabernacle there was the table of showbread, there was the altar of incense, there was the lamp stands. We talked about that. I can't go over it. I won't, go, I won't get much further. But this verse we started at today is moving us from this architecture, this building that God made that's supposed to show us Jesus, really that's what it's aimed at. We're moving from what they call the outer court to the inner place. And that was the sanctuary. Now we call this a sanctuary. A lot of churches do that. And it's because it's supposed to be where people meet God. That's why we call it that. And this, it should be. Some churches it makes you run away from God. But it should be where you meet God. So if we're walking, that's why I said next week I'll get my husband to help me and we'll erect something here and I'll really make the point because the kids will be here. Uh, as, we're, as we're going throughout this piece, this building, this tent, tent of meeting, some places it's called, a tabernacle, then now today we're talking about that place that you might have heard it called the Holy of Holies. You ever heard that? The inner place, the most holy place. It's the place, and now you see it on the screen, and you heard the scripture quote, where the Ark of the Covenant, and I'm going to tell you what that is in a minute, where this box was, where this box was. And the idea, as if they went through all this progression, after they had washed their hands and did sacrifice and gone through this progression, they went to that place, then they went to the next place, and they saw the table of showbread, they saw the altar of incense. It was a progression. Now only once a year, you heard them say it, right? Only once a year, the high priest went into the very innermost place 
to make a sacrifice for the people that would handle their sins for a year. Oh, I can hardly get throughout this without talking in tongues. That would handle that for a year, okay? <laughs> handle their sins for a year. The people didn't have to worry. That inner place is called the inner sanctuary, the most holy, the holy of holies, whatever you, whatever you want. And you heard it, and you can find it in your Bible if you're in Exodus chapter 25. That's the place where God said, build this, get it ready for me, because from that place, I want to meet. I want to show up. I'm wanting to be available. So the idea of that place, I'm starting big and I'm going to go small. The idea of that place was that it was the place of forgiveness. That's the bottom line. It was the place where sins were forgiven. That's just, that's all it was about. There was a box, and I'm going to tell you about the box, or an ark. Well, that doesn't communicate to us, because ark, we think of Noah's ark. But it was a box. What it really was was a coffin, and I'll get back to that, okay? And so special things were stored there. But on the top of it, you see it there, was uh, that, that version said um, atonement place, I think, atonement cover. But what we know it as, most people wouldn't recognize this term, the mercy seat. The mercy seat. You ever hear anyone talk about the mercy seat? And the reason they called it that is because, again, as you go through the scripture, you see where you could encounter God and blood was sprinkled on it and the people's sins could be forgiven. If you, <laughs> the mercy seat represented the forgiveness of God. Now, they had to do it time and time and time again because Jesus hadn't come. He wasn't the perfect sacrifice. So the blood they put on that mercy seat was just a type of insufficient. It wasn't all there, but it handled it for a year. And do you know about, let me tell you something about Jewish people. I grew up in Jersey, just a few miles from the Rabbinical College of America. Let me tell you something. Those people believed on the power of that sacrifice. When that sacrifice was offered and the priest came out alive and said, hey, it's been handled, do you know they understood beyond a shadow of a doubt that they didn't have another issue like that for a year? Okay? They got it. So now, let's make some application for us. Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, his blood sprinkled on our behalf, given for us so we can be whole and cleansed and can be in his very presence. And do you know that some of us still listen to the enemy and say, oh, I'm not so sure God's really forgiven me. Or I'm not so sure what I did is, is worthy of forgiveness. Or I did this so long, even though I'm forgiven now, I don't think God can trust me. Do you hear so when we look at the tabernacle, we get a wonderful picture, not only of God, but also of people and what had to happen. So the, the sanctuary or the inner place or this place where this box was, that's all that was there, it was that box. I'm going to tell you about it in a minute. That was the place of forgiveness. That's what no, is known as the mercy seat. That's where God himself dwelled. His presence was there. Everyone didn't get to go there, but his presence was there. But once the priest got to that place, he could make the sacrifice and he could, the sins could be forgiven. And as we said, the people didn't have to worry for another year about that. And he said, there, I'm going to meet with you. I'm going to meet with you. And so here's a correlation I want to, I want to really get this to us. The correlation here is in this place, do you understand if anyone can ever get to God, they can experience forgiveness. Yes. That's why Jesus came. Yes. If you can ever get to God, you can experience forgiveness. Sin has separated. The enemy has separated. But the scripture she read today was great. It says there's nothing anymore that separates us. But even this, this illustration said if you can clean up good enough, if you can be pure enough, if we can wash you enough, if we can handle the ritual enough, if you can just get to me, God basically says, then I have forgiveness. Amen. That's why it's called the mercy seat. If you can ever get to God, you can have forgiveness. Remember that. Remember that in your life. You can, if you don't believe me, there's all kinds of scripture to, to, to play it out. I have like 12 things here, which I'm not going to tell you. I'll come back to that. That'd be a good Wednesday night teaching. All right. If you can ever get to God, you can get forgiveness. So now, let's talk about what was in that ark. It's called an ark. It's a box. And really what it is, it was, it was, um, it was fashioned after a coffin. 
And so it had in it, and this, the, the video almost started telling us, three things that were so important. This is the inner place, the inner sanctuary. I mean, this is it. This is God. This is the Almighty. This is the place you hear all the stories about. And sometimes they're true, sometimes they're not about. If someone went in there with sin or had an issue, the high priest would fall dead. This is, this is where Zechariah was serving when he heard John the Baptist going to be born and he was struck dumb. I mean, this is, this is the presence of God. This is it. In that place, there was one thing. This, they called the Ark of the Covenant or the, the box. I'm going to call it the box. Will you allow me that because of our... And in it, there were three things. Number one, there were the unbroken tablets of the law. The law. Remember Moses and the law? Remember who broke the first one? Moses. Got mad. Remember that? Yeah. But they had an unbroken one. That was there. Unbroken tablets of the law was stored in there. That's to remind the people, of course, of God's law. In there also was stored... Um, a glass thing of manna. Manna. Manna is the bread that happened in the wilderness. Do you remember that? When the people murmured against God and God sent that supernatural bread, this reminded them of his, un his provision. He never gave up on his people. That manna was stored there. There was a, a day's worth, an omer, the old King James says, of manna stored in that box. That's what the priest is going to do it. And also the third thing that was stored in that box was Aaron's rod. And again, I could do teaching on all this and be just as happy as I could be. A rod. Uh, some people, you, you see that word. Let me tell you what it was. It was Aaron's walking stick. Do you remember how much that stick came in handy? Aaron's walking stick. Remember when the plagues happened and God sent Moses down to get his people out of bondage and they had this thing with Pharaoh? Aaron's walking stick came in very handy. It was a walking stick that turned into a snake or a serpent and ate up the other ones. It was a walking stick that was useful during the first three plagues. So that, now later on, it has other significance, but that also was stored in that place. All of those three items are stored, but it's covered by this thing that's called the mercy seat. Or if you have a new translation, it says the atonement cover, where the blood is sprinkled and it's the place of forgiveness. All of this stuff is covered by what I'm calling the mercy of God or the forgiveness of God. See, so when the scripture tells us and talks about Jesus being the fullness of God, in other words, all of God, it's like paralleling him, really, to the sanctuary. He's the tabernacle. But this idea of the sanctuary, the place where you meet God, that's Jesus. We would all agree, right? Yeah. So, so the scripture is teaching us about that. But I stop because in a minute I want to say, just like that box contained, basically what the box contained is everything that the people of God knew about God. Every experience they had, he was a provider, he was their authority, he gave them leadership. The box was their visual understanding of what we know about God. It was all in the box. Now, Jesus comes and we say that he fulfills this or he really is, um, a, this is a type of Christ because of what we read in Colossians. Everything we know or need to know about God is wrapped up, tied up in Jesus. And I made that point so well last week. I don't want to hit it again. If you weren't here, get a copy of the, of the tape, please. So Jesus was the sanctuary of God, still is, in the same way that the ark contained everything that the people knew about God. Jesus has within him everything we ever need to know about God. His power, his authority, his grace, everything is wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I told you about Jesus being that one who has the breath of God who had the breath of God, the first one since Adam. But what does this have to do with us? That's the question. If Jesus is the embodiment, that's another word, the embodiment of the ark. If Jesus is the one who represents God's his authority, his word, he represents God's provision, he represents all of this, then what does it have to do with us? Because Christ lives on the inside of us. Now let me give you a few scriptures to go home and read. First of all, when we're talking about Jesus uh, being the, the righteousness of God, we understand so much about this ark. We understand so much about Jesus when we understand the ark. John chapter 6, verse 51. Remember I told you there's manna in that box? I'm going to call it a box. There's manna in that ark of the covenant, that box. Well, Jesus is the one in John 6, 51 that says, Listen, I am the bread of life that came straight from heaven. So in other words, he's helping the people see years later, oh, you don't have to worry about that anymore. It's all fulfilled in me. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. Remember I told you Aaron's rod is in that box. 
Well, Jesus, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says Jesus comes and he becomes the high priest. So that thing represented that rod, that stick, represented the authority that God gave to his leaders. Well, Jesus comes and he represents that. And so in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 says there was one final high priest and his name was Jesus. Okay. So we got this box with these things in it that are symbolic of all that God is that help us understand who Jesus is. But here's what just gets me so excited. On the top of it is this mercy seat. On the top of it is this atonement cover. On the top of it is where this, this thing is sprinkled. Now remember I told you earlier, I'm calling it a box, but what it really looked like, it looked like the coffins that they used in Egypt. It looked like the coffins that they used in Egypt. So in my mind, God is saying, you know, you can look at that stuff all you want, but be remembered or reminded that you never, none of it, you never connected with me enough. You didn't believe, you hollered, and I sent you food. You, you, you wanted leadership, I had to send you leadership. You didn't believe I was going to get you out of the desert. The tablets, you could never keep the law. But don't worry about it. It's all in the box, and it's covered by mercy. My mercy is going to kick in. That's like a coffin. It's there to remind you. But what you really need, you don't need to keep, you need to run into my mercy. Because I have forgiven you for all of those areas. I have forgiven you for where you've rejected me. Talk to his people now. I've forgiven you from where you haven't been available to me. I've forgiven you that I had to run behind you. You never sought after me. I was always coming behind you wanting to be with you. I've forgiven you. There's a mercy seat there. My blood is sprinkled, and it all represented what was going to happen in the person of Jesus Christ later. Okay, so there's the mercy seat. All that represented God was in the box. All of what was above was the mercy seat. It was a place of forgiveness. It covered it all, and, and it, it was like God was reminding the people of their past, but really helping them see their past was also forgiven because of that mercy seat. Now, here's where I'm going with this for the last 10 minutes. If Jesus, and we agree, was the sanctuary of God, or in other words, the embodiment of this, in him, yes, was the authority of God. In him, yes, was the word of God. In him, we have the provision of God. Everything that God is, you find in Jesus. That's the song. All you are, what is it all? What is it? Give me the first line. All you were, all you are, all you ever will be is in the name, is in Jesus. So if he embodied all of that and he represented that, then we go back to Colossians chapter 2 and we get what the Apostle Paul says and we see it in verse 9. For in Christ all the fullness of the Godhead lived in bodily form. But verse 10, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. So in other words, all of God lives in Christ, but now Christ lives on the inside of us. So that means that we have all we need to be God's tabernacle. That's the bottom line. What it means to be the sanctuary of God, it means to have God at work, alive in us, and everything, everything that's a part of us as a result of Christ being in our lives, as a result of us surrendering to what I'm calling the tabernacle status, saying, okay, Lord, here I am. I'm ready. Whatever you need to do, I'm not just going to pray a prayer and be done. No, no, I'm going to be there for people. Whatever it is that we, we have it because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19 says it further. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. But every translator always after these fullness scriptures goes to another verse. I wish they didn't do that because people don't keep reading. The next verse says, and through him he reconciled to himself all things, whether on earth or things in heaven, and made peace through his blood shed on the cross, and you were once alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. In other words, you couldn't come here. You couldn't experience any of this. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death and presented you holy in his sight. Presented you holy in his sight. So that means not only is God the fullness of God in Jesus Christ, but Christ is in us. So the fullness of God is in us. He came to give us that fullness, that life. 
Now, what does this mean? I'm telling you, it can get very confusing. It can have your head spinning. What are the implications? What does it mean to be the tabernacle of God, the sanctuary of God, to have all these interesting things living on the inside of us? What are the bottom line implications? Basically, here's what I want to leave with you today. It's just one thought. Remember I told you, all of the process... I'll give you several of these next week too. But all of this process for getting to this place was so what could happen? Does anyone remember? Huh? Say it again. Forgiveness. So people could be forgiven. Everything, we go, this whole process, all this, this sacrifice, just washing of the hands, the purification, the incense going up, all of that was for what? People say they can meet God and encounter God and they could be forgiven, right? You got me? Okay, so then we say Christ lives on the inside. Well, no, let's stop. Next thing we say then is the fullness of God is in Christ. So do you agree then that if people could get to Christ, I'm just saying if you follow me, they could be forgiven. You understand that, right? Yes. Okay, so now here's my bottom line implication for today. I'll pick it up in a few weeks. If Christ lives on the inside of you, then if people can get to you, they should be able to get forgiven you understand do you understand yes. to be the tabernacle of God has very little to do with being specially chosen right. it has very little to do some but it has very little to do with knowing every type and shadow of what, what it has to do with is so that people can come to you or you can come to them the tabernacle moved that was the beauty of the tabernacle it moved and they could encounter a living God and be forgiven. And be forgiven. That's really the bottom line. That's the idea of why is Christ on the inside of me? That's the deal with why we have Pentecost. Remember a few weeks ago, Bishop talked about why we need the Holy Spirit. Remember that? It was, she was awesome. She gave several things. She had just gotten back from her trip. It was like three Sundays ago. Why do we need the Holy Spirit? What's the deal with the Holy Spirit? The main thing, she says, don't forget passion for souls. Yes. yes. So, I get as excited, and we go, oh, hallelujah, I'm the tabernacle of God. Yes, the life of God lives in me. Yes, the healing of God lives in me. Yes, the health of God lives in me. All of that is true. Yes, 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 it all lives in me. But the purpose of that is really the bottom line is so that when you encounter people, they can encounter God and his forgiveness. Right. That's, that's really what the bottom line is about being the tabernacle of God. It becomes the house of the one who came to earth and shed his blood so people could be set free. And so, so when we look at this, and like I said, next week I'll have some illustration because I want to go into some of these articles a little further. I didn't want to go too far today, but I want us to get this idea of all of that was not because God was so holy that he, he didn't want to be with people. It's the opposite. He wanted to be with people. All of this is leading up to all of the excitement, all of the incense, all of the sacrifice leading up to getting to that place of forgiveness or we call it mercy. Some translations say the place of atonement. And so everything else that's in there is important, but it's not as important. It's covered by the mercy seat of God. It's very symbolic. All the other stuff that is symbolic of their, their failures, everything in that, that coffin was symbolic of the people's failures to trust God. And God's graciousness to go beyond them, all covered by his mercy. And he said, if you can get to that place, Boy, if you can get through everything else, you can come to me and you can be forgiven. And we've already talked to you about what Jesus said a few weeks ago. He said we're clean by the word he's spoken to us. So we've gone past the first thing. He says we've become pure. We've gone to this. He says we've become righteous when we believe in him. We keep going. And now we get all of this for what? To be righteous and pure and stuff? No! So that we can bring the life of God to other people. That's called forgiveness. Yes. And that's the whole purpose of that. So again, like I said, people do teachings and they can do weeks and weeks. And I might do it on Wednesdays too because you can ask questions. But they get carried away with all the symbolism and sometimes miss the essence. The essence of understanding what it means to be the tabernacle of God is to know that you're the carrier of the forgiveness of God. And so I could ask you a lot of questions today. I could say when you encounter your irritable cousin... I'm just making this up. You know, the cousin gets on your nerves. Do they walk away knowing they've encountered the life of God? Or do they walk away feeling like I'll never go to church again? That's the question. I can ask you a question. When your children, when you discipline your children, 
and you have to handle things that you have to handle. Your parents be parents, but do those children, are they connecting this with, this is helping me to be a better person so I can live long and I can serve God? Or are they connecting with anger and impatience? When we're dealing with our spouses, I'm talking about what it means to be the carrier of the life of God. When we're dealing with our spouses and you have, a, uh, you have a fight, you're like, oh, I never knew. Yeah, yeah, let me tell you, people have fights. They have disagreements. I heard Joyce Meyer this week say, someone said to her, I want to marry someone compatible. She goes, well, good luck. I don't know one marriage or anybody, everyone is compatible. You know? But when you have those things happen, what's it mean to be the tabernacle of God, the life carrier of God? Is there forgiveness flowing there? Hear me. Is there forgiveness flowing there or is there condemnation? If there's condemnation, then you're not rep properly representing the tabernacle of God. Because if you can get to God, whatever people got to God, they got forgiveness. The person who just gets on your last nerves at work, the devil has sent them. Their assignment is to, is to really get you out of that job. You know it. It's as close to demonic as you see. And they really, I mean, you just know why they're there. They're sent to buffet you when they come into your presence. <laughs> See, again, I'm not going into all the implications. But the reason the priests and everyone else wanted to be so wonderfully clean before they got to God is because if they got to God with any baggage that wasn't supposed to be there, it was, it was burnt up, it was eaten up, it was handled. So when people get to us, we're worried about negative rubbing off on us. No, no, it's the opposite. What we have should envelop them talking to you about being a tabernacle of God. Oh, I could go on and on and on and on with illustration. But I'm saying, I'm reminding you, the first time God gave his breath, his life, to live in a person was Adam, his creation. And then he couldn't do that anymore. So he had to come and live in a tabernacle. And he wanted to be among his people. And then after the tabernacle, there was a temple. Temple and tabernacle are almost interchangeable. The only difference is the temple was one place, the tabernacle traveled. And then there was Jesus. As we go down in history, the life of God, the presence of God was in Jesus. But it didn't stop there. Right. And we don't, sometimes we make it stop. Don't make it stop there. Who was it that used to say the buck stops here? No, Jesus, the, the Spirit of God doesn't stop with Jesus. He's living in me through Christ. I've accepted Christ. He lives in me. Amen. On Wednesday nights, we've been learning about the visions, the four visions that Dr. T.L. Christ saw, you know. We have five visions that we've seen. We see God in flesh through Adam. We see God among his people through the tabernacle. We see God living among his people for the temple. We see God living in Jesus, and we see God living in us as the life-giving support system that God has created so this earth doesn't go to pot Amen. while we help bring Jesus back. That's what it means to be the tabernacle of God. I'll give you more. I'm going to let you go, but I'll give you more next week. I'm going to bring my illustrated. I'm ready for a, a tabernacle model up here because this will really make the point. So we see how significant it is to realize not only that God wants to live in us, but that he does live in us and what that means not just to us, but to everybody around us. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for your life. I thank you for your presence. We thank you today that we are your tabernacles. We're surrendering to this, this idea. It's working on us. It's really working on us. This idea that you live in us. You love to live in us and through us. And that because of what you did through Jesus on the cross, we are not only pure and holy and blameless, but we become the, the carriers of forgiveness to a hurting world. Lord, may it, come so at, uh, may it become such reality each of, to each of us what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be filled with your spirit, what it means to not be rejected but accepted by you, and what it means for us to accept others, Lord. May this understanding move from the lofty and the ritual and the religious to the day by day by day by day walk that we have in you. I thank you, Lord, that every time we talk, as we visit together as a church, we're finding out what it means to be Jesus people. We're finding out what it means to help people understand the Jesus life. We're understanding what it means to be not only forgiven, but to offer forgiveness. To not just be healed, but to be healers. To not just be reconciled to you, but to reconcile others. Lord, this is a reality. It's ongoing. Open our eyes to always get it to get it. Never leaving this place feeling 
like we haven't found you, but leaving this place feeling like we are your carriers because it's the truth. And so I bless my brothers and my sisters today. May, may all that we do this week be a reflection of this understanding that you've come to dwell in us through Jesus Christ. And therefore, you reach out to people in the same way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand on your feet. I want to pray for you, those of you. Oh, yes, sir. Yes. Pastor, I just want I just wanted to say, now you understand why I said on TV up in Seattle, if you can get to me, you can get to God. That's it. That's true. That's why I got that. Yeah. That's good. The reason I'm buttoning in, this, this is the New Testament church. They did that in the New Testament. That's it. That's it. I love it. Thank you. That's exactly right. That's our reality. I don't know how many ways we say it. I'm just going to keep working on it. Someone else, Bishop, has another one. I'm, I love to talk about the tabernacle, but we're going to keep getting it till we realize our great significance in the plan of God.